handed it out a little bit more to Eileen and I said, nothing. I just extended the palm and she said, I thought it was obvious. I thought we were a snake. Well, the tension in the room is going up and up and up and up and up. Now, the easiest thing I could have said is something to break the tension, but I felt the tension was really important and I was listening and sensing the room, not the words, but the tension. Mm. Eileen finished the sentence all by herself. So I'm curious, Chris, right now, describe the characteristics of a snake from your perspective. Uh, when I think of a snake, I think of something slippery and uncontrollable. I think of something a little bit dangerous. Uh, I think of something scary. Hmm. So it's a great Western perspective. And Eileen is from the East, and they have a different perspective on snakes. What she said next was quite profound. She said, we've forgotten to be like a snake. A snake sheds its skin every season and leaves behind what it doesn't need and uses its tongue to sense a head. We've forgotten to sense a head for our clients. We've forgotten to adjust and move around, and we've become slow snakes. Got it. Yeah. And all of a sudden, the tension in the room evaporated. Of course. And people started going, yeah, 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 I can see how that's happening. And, and at 12.35, that conversation finished. And the CEO never mentioned food once in those 35 minutes to me, Chris. But here's the thing. If we didn't ask Eileen, just by simple reaching out of the hand, the group would have been stuck in group think, thinking they were a bird of prey, a beautiful osprey that could swoop and adjust. As a result of that, the organization now uses the snake for product code names. They've integrated the mm -hmm. snake into the conversation in sales conversations with customers. Uh, they have awards based on different kinds of snakes. And in China, a snake has very different connotations to people in the West. In people in the West, the original story of, of, of a Christian perspective is Adam and Eve and you were tempted by this evil snake. Original in sin. Other, yeah, in other cultures, snakes are, uh, uh, are about medicine and snakes are about many other things. But again, notice how we all had listening filters on about snakes. And, and we just need to be careful because we're not even conscious sometimes when we think about stories because we're not thinking about their meaning. And that's the highest level of listening is not helping you make sense of what they're saying, but helping them make sense of what they're thinking. I think what's really interesting about that story and, and, and about listening in general is the sort of correlation with empathy, mm. right? If you're a good listener, you're, you're in a better place to be empathetic. And there is a lot of interest in empathy at the moment, not just because of what's going on in the world and the importance of empathizing with people who are suffering because of it, but, but also even in a work context, you know, for some time, there's been this focus on uh, product development methodologies like design thinking, where, where listening to your customer and having deep empathy with your customer uh, is, is uh, a critical part of how you design great solutions. Mm. Um, is, is, that, is that a fair comparison? Does, does being a, a deep listener help you be more empathetic? It helps you notice your perspective and your orientation uh, I'll zoom you into a workshop we, we usually do when we're face-to-face, -face. not so much now these days, but the workshop is really simple. People have to construct a jigsaw puzzle in a workshop I give them, and they're given five mm. minutes, 60 pieces to complete. Rarely do people finish, rarely. And um, what you notice is a lot of siloed competitive behavior. People are broken into groups of three, and only one person is allowed to touch the jigsaw puzzle. One person's allowed to give instruction. And one person observes what's going on. Now, Chris, here's where empathy fits in. The groups that always finish the most pieces have one thing in common. The person instructing the person constructing always stands directly behind the constructor so they can see mm. what the constructor can see. The ones with the lower scores are the ones that are sitting in their original seats at the table 
giving instruction. And there's often a reflection made in the debrief. And I ask the group the question, we call ourselves a customer-centric organization. We have empathy for the customer's problem. And yet we sit across the table. And yet we can see in this really simple exercise, the most empathetic thing to do in this exercise, oh, by the way, Chris, I didn't mention the constructors blindfolded. So it's a little degree of difficulty for them. Got it. So how many people considered standing behind the constructor to adopt their position, a position of empathy? Because what they see very quickly from this position directly behind the constructor is they see what they don't see and they see where their hands are and what's getting in their way. But most of us, whether we're thinking about design thinking for an internal project or a customer project, we talk a good game to empathy, but rarely do we stand behind and really take a position of what the customer is going through, whether that customer is internal or external. And to me, that exercise, or it's, it's less than 5% of the room. Chris, no matter whether I do that in a ballroom with 600 people or I do it in, mm. in a boardroom with eight people, only one person occasionally might adopt that position. But here's the thing that's fascinating to me. We have all these co- creations going on with people doing jigsaw puzzles all around the room. Everybody is so blinkered in their thinking that they think that their way of doing it is the fastest. And rarely does any group ever look up, look across the room and go, oh, that's a good idea. I might adapt in the balance of our time together to get to an outcome faster. And the opposite of empathy is siloed thinking. It's the blinkeredness to think, that our organization's way of doing it or our department's way of doing it is the right way to do it. And for me, empathy is the willingness to suspend your ego long enough to say, I don't know the answer, but with curiosity together with someone else, whether that's someone else as a department, a division, or just one other person, I can probably get to the outcome quicker. You and I, Oscar, were fortunate enough to uh, collaborate together on a panel recently. Mm. Um, and we talked about how uh, Zoom fatigue and working and living through this sort of digitally mediated world that we, that we work, work in today, has this made listening harder for people? And is there any techniques or suggestions you can, you can share to help people de- deal with Zoom fatigue? Yeah. So we we think about those initial three concepts as a platform, as a foundation, Chris. Switch switch off as Mm -hmm. many notifications as we can because we can't switch off the computer. That's how we kind of zoom in or the phone. But at least switch off the notifications. Make sure you drink water. Make sure you invite the other person to drink water. Make sure you take three deep breaths before you dial into the call during the Zoom fatigue. And it's a real thing. And it's a real thing because you're firing up neural pathways that haven't existed before. You are simultaneously trying to process your idea while staring down the barrel of a very tiny lens while trying to look at the screen to see facial reactions because we, 40% of us, listen visually. So if you are in a video conferencing technology that allows you to do this, some of them have something called gallery view where you can see a whole bunch of faces all at once. And if you're in a one-on-one, this will be much simpler. Always switch to speaker view rather than gallery view. Gallery view will distract you. So switch to Mm. speaker view. The next thing you want to do is put your webcam at your eye level. So if that means you need to put some books under a laptop or slightly adjust your webcam because maybe it's not uh, embedded into your, your laptop, Make sure your camera Mm. is at eye level and then move the speaker's eyes as close as possible to the webcam. This will reduce your Zoom fatigue by a minimum of 22% because all you have to do is concentrate on looking straight into the webcam, which means you will be able to see the speaker's eyes. 
you'll be able to see their facial movements and you won't have to turn your head on an angle and then keep coming back when you're asked to speak. So tip number one, webcam to eye level. Tip number two, out of gallery view into speaker, active speaker view. And tip number three, bring the speaker's eyes as close to the webcam as possible. The next, Got it. The next thing, if you're a participant, sometimes the host might mandate not a good thing to do mandate everybody has their webcam on um the, mm. the next point i would make is if you're the host be choiceful sometimes a video conference despite the fact it's really convenient and in most people's organizations just to click on a piece of software to set it up sometimes the best mm. way to have a conversation might be on the phone audio only so the second tip to reduce zoom fatigue is be choiceful you should be having at least 20% of your meetings during a day that are not visual. It's going to give your brain a rest. It should also mm. encourage you to maybe, and these typically one-on-one -on -one conversations with somebody you might know well, walk while you're talking and encourage them to do the same. A, they'll be grateful. B, it'll create a completely different listening dynamic for you and for them. Especially if you're trying to diverge on an idea, you know, you're in early brainstorming, absolutely. Audio only, go for a walk together. You'll be pleasantly surprised what that will do. So tip number two, be choiceful about the modality that you offer. And then tip number three is make sure that if you do have to choose video and you're the host, that the modalities change a minimum every 10 minutes every 10 minutes. The maximum attention span of an adult in a video conference is between six and eight minutes. So put a question and answer into a chat box. Move the modality from, hey, there's one person just speaking to use a breakout room and get other people speaking to each other. Move into a poll slide or a Q&A and break up that modality. So these mm. simple techniques are going to change the way. So where the struggle with Zoom fatigue is, staring endlessly at a screen where I don't interact, I'm fixed in a seat and I don't get to move around and I can't see the body language of anybody else. That's why Zoom fatigue comes around. So get your webcam to eye level, move it into speaker view, look at it. Choose the modality. Sometimes it's a phone call is the right thing to do. And the third thing is break it up. And if you're the listener, make a suggestion to the host at the 10 minute mark, at the 20 minute mark, at the 30 minute mark in the chat box. Break it up because it's very difficult for adults to hold their attention for longer than 10 minutes on a task. No, I love this. And I think it's a real example, Oscar, of how technology um, has an insidious impact on us. This notion at some point, in history, uh, somebody sat down coding a calendar application, decided to chunk the world into one hour chunks. And, and I want to find them <laughs> because They're productivity killers. Yeah. And when, and now that everything's mediated through, you know, a Zoom call, everything has to be an hour long and everything has to be kind of video only. And you're absolutely right. There are some problems we can solve in two minutes. And there are others where we need to combine an exchange with some reflection, um, but we're constantly forced into these sort of one-hour blocks of, of communication, and it, it is completely exhausting. So thanks for the tips. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to definitely work on um, breaking up my day uh, in a different way. Yeah, look for bonus points if you're, if you're a host at the moment. Uh, for the last four weeks, I've been running webinars with over 100 people. And the mm. most commented thing I get back in my feedback is an exercise I get people to do for five minutes. I invite everybody to switch off their webcams, put their web uh, their audio onto mute, and for five minutes they get to be by themselves and just ponder this question, what am I not listening to in myself? And I'm saying absolutely nothing, Chris. And the people hmm. come back and I ask them to make a one word reflection. What's, what's your state like at the moment? Transformational, calming, yeah. impactful. 
and I'm literally saying nothing and these people are coming. 